The name Alex Trebek is a household word in modern America. He's the host of the iconic television show Jeopardy. We've been watching the quiz show for many years, and I console myself with the quick response of the contestants by thinking they're not that intelligent. They've just been endowed with a good memory and can recall that which they've read in a second. Alex is the perfect host for Jeopardy. He's sharp, eloquent, handsome, congenial, and very likable. He's almost like a family member to millions. That's why it was a shock for most of us to hear that he was diagnosed with a terrible and often terminal disease. He's the face of the classic game show we've all grown up with. Fighting his battle with cancer. This week I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. This is one of the deadliest types of cancer. Stage four pancreatic cancer, meaning it spread to other parts of his body. Everybody loves Alex Trebek. So I just want to say from all of us here, um, the clue is stay strong, Alex. I feel this surge of sadness, depression. Thank you. And of course, our thoughts and prayers mm -hmm. uh, are with Alex Trebek and his family this morning. All right. Please keep me in your good thoughts and prayers. Believe me, it means a lot. Alex Trebek has asked more than 480,000 questions since the inception of Jeopardy over 30 years ago, but he's never publicly asked one very special question, the ultimate question, the question about how we can find everlasting life. Are you an educated person? Yes. What's the world's biggest selling book of all time? Bible? Maybe the Holy Bible? You got it. Yeah, Are you familiar with the rich young ruler that ran up to Jesus and said, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I'm not familiar. Yeah, and Jesus said something strange to him, which we'll look at in a minute, but how would you answer that question? If I said to you, What should I do to inherit eternal life? How would you answer it? And before you do, let me just give you a little scenario. Let's say one day you just found you were losing appetite, you had no energy, and you decided to go to the doctor because you had pains in your stomach, and he walks away and comes back sometime later and said, we've done tests, you've got pancreatic cancer. It's incurable, it's terminal, I'm sorry, you're gonna have a painful death, you won't last too long, I'll give you some painkillers, they won't help much, but it's all we can do, I'm so sorry, so you go home, you're very depressed, you don't feel like traveling or playing sport or partying, and you're asking the question, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So, you're now asking that question with a sense of seriousness, because you're gonna die real soon. Right. How would you answer that question? And this isn't a, a far off scenario. More than 600,000 Americans will die of cancer in the next year, so this, is, this isn't a far I mean, out scenario. Not a, it's not a far out question, it's just, I mean, it's an appropriate question, like you said. Well, you know, I'll do what most people do. I'll go to God. If I knew I was going to die, I'll be, I'll go to God. I'll, I'll start, you know, you know, they know they're going to die. There's nothing else to do but pretty much pray to God. And, yeah. and if you believe in the afterlife or not, whether you believe in the afterlife or not, um, you know, that's what most people do. That's what I would do. You know what Jesus said to that young man? Oh, uh, no, I don't. It was very strange. He said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And then he said something strange. He said, you know the commandments. And he went through some of the commandments with the Ten Commandments with him. Do you know why he did that? No, I don't. Well, firstly, he said, there's none good but God. We think we're good, but... God in God's book is moral perfection, so none of us are good. Only God is good. He's the only one that's morally perfect. And the reason Jesus gave him the commandments is because the Bible says, by the law, the moral law, is the knowledge of sin. The Ten Commandments show us God's standard of righteousness. So let me ask you a question, Anthony. Do you think you're a good person? Do I believe in my heart I'm a good person? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try and change your mind about that, the same way Jesus changed the mind of that rich young ruler. It would be hard for you too, but go ahead. Okay. How many lies have you told in your life? Plenty. What do you call someone who's told plenty of lies? It just depends, because there's different type of lies. So yeah, it really. I mean, genuine lies, genuine not something. Genuine lies. I see where you're going, but yeah, I'll call myself a liar. Uh, have you ever stolen something, even if it's small, in your whole life, irrespective of its value? Of 
course. What do you call someone who steals things? A, th- a thief. So what are you? I am not a thief, but... You're a, li- <laughs> you're a lying thief. You're a lying thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? No. OMG? Okay. Anthony, when you use God's name as a cuss word, you incur his anger because you're violating that commandment which says you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Death sentence for blasphemy in the Old Testament. It's that serious in his eyes. One to go, and I appreciate your honesty and patience with me, Anthony. Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? <laughs> you know the answer to that. <laughs> you had sex before marriage. Okay, Anthony, I'm not judging you. I'm just you. a horrible person now. That I wouldn't say you're horrible. According to this, I'm horrible. I wouldn't say you're horrible, <laughs> but I would say you're guilty like the rest of us because yeah, you just yeah. told me you're a lying, thieving, blasphemous, fornicating, <laughs> adulterer at heart. So here's the big question. We are sinners. Here's the big question. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, are you going to be innocent or guilty? If he judges me by those Ten Commandments, according to the Ten Commandments, I will be guilty. Heaven or hell? You know, God is forgiving God, though. Oops, you've just violated the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, really? oh, yes. First commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. Second is, don't make yourself a graven image or a false image of God. And I did that before I was a Christian. Instead of acknowledging my sins, I changed the nature of God and says, I think God is like this. And I shaped a God to suit myself. I made a God in my image, a snuggly, cuddly God that I could snuggle up to like a teddy bear, a non-existent figment of my imagination, the place of imagery. But the God of the Bible says he'll by no means clear the guilty. And every time we sin, we store up his wrath that's going to be revealed on the day of judgment. So you're up the river Niagara without a paddle. So what can you do to be made right with God? Most people think they can even up the scales, but it wouldn't work in a court of law. You say, Judge, no, Judge, I robbed the bank, and I tell you, I'll do some good things. You're going to say, so what? You're going to jail. He only judges by the crimes. It's the same with God. Great, great. So do you know what you need? What do I need? God's mercy. If you're in court and you're guilty, you can't do anything. You fling yourself the on the mercy of the court. Some type of mercy. Yeah, and the Bible says God is rich in mercy to all that call upon him. And God can show you mercy because Jesus suffered and died on the cross to take the punishment for the sin of the world. Now, most of us know that, but we don't know this. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. If you're in court and someone pays you fine, a judge can let you go. A judge can say, Anthony, there's a stack of speeding fines. This is deadly serious, but someone's paid him. You're free to go. And he can do that which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, you can walk. And even though we're guilty, we can walk out of God's courtroom on the day of judgment because Jesus paid the fine in full in his life's blood. That means God can legally let us live forever. He can take the death sentence off us because the fine was paid in full by the Savior on the cross who then rose from the dead and defeated death. And all you have to do to find everlasting life is repent of your sins. Stop saying I'm a good person and say, no, I'm a sinner that's loved that which is wrong and I need God's mercy. I'd be damned if God gave me justice. Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. Repentance must be sincere to be genuine. You don't say I'm a Christian and you lie and steal and fornicate. That's playing the hypocrite. Be genuine. And trust in Jesus like you trust a parachute. Now, tell me, why would you put on a parachute if you had to jump 10,000 feet? People would trust it because they know that it's safe. They know that it would stop them from the impact. They trust it. They know it's not going to hurt them. Right. And fear is the motive for putting the parachute on. You don't want to hit the ground 125 miles yeah, an hour you on your the, face. You put the parachute on, the fear decreases. So That's right. So, Anthony, let fear be your friend today. Say, look, I'm in, I'm in big trouble with God. If I die in my sins, I'm going to be damned. This is terrible. God, forgive me. Let that fear drive you to the foot of the cross where you're genuinely sorry for your sins and you put your faith in Jesus and you've got God's promise you'll pass from death to life the moment you do that. And the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. He's without sin, so you can totally trust in him. Is this making sense? This makes sense, yeah. You're going to think about what we talked about? When I'm, I'm going to tr- finish training my nephew and, wh- and I'm going to be actually thinking about that and probably tell him <laughs> what we talked about. So today you're going to repent and trust the Savior. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I am saying that, yes. That makes sense. It's really been a joy. I don't know, I'm appreciative that you saw me out of, I don't know, a couple of people at the park and decided to interview me. I appreciate it a lot. This is the Evidence Bible, everything you'd ever want to know about evangelism. It's over 1,800 pages, 
filled to overflowing with apologetical arguments, everything you'd ever want to know about reaching the lost. It's available at livingwaters.com, amazon.com, or at your Christian bookstore.